two wonderful poets with us today, D.A. Powell and Elena Corinna Byrne. D.A. will read first. D.A. Powell is the author of five collections, including Useless Landscape or A Guide for Boys, which received the National Book Critics Circle Award in Poetry. His honors include the Kingsley Tufts Prize in Poetry, the Shelley Memorial Prize from the Poetry Society of America, and the John Updike Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, as well as fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. He lives in San Francisco and teaches at University of San Francisco. Here's a brilliant poet, D.A. Powell. Thanks so much, Harry. It's wonderful to get to um, do this broadcast with you. I've been such a fan of yours and of uh, your late uh, wife, Holly. Um, so um, it's an honor really to um, get to visit with you on Zoom. I, I'm gonna read from Useless Landscape or A Guide for Boys. Uh, this poem is entitled Tender Mercies. It takes its title from uh, a film uh, by uh, Bruce Beersford. Um, but uh, it also uh, echoes back to uh, biblical sources. I realized that I was writing a lot about the Central Valley where I spent my teenage years and early 20s. And um, I began to compile what I thought of as a kind of seed list um, of all the things that you could find in the Central Valley. And it sort of grows out of that. Tender Mercies. The dandelions, ditch blown brood, the evening snow and dew soaked flocks, the brewer's pea, the Jepson's pea, these the bright eyes of the viridian fields. In chaparral, the hillside pea and angled pea, intensities of light and pomp that distress the easy upswept grass. The smack the rain plants as it smudges past and penetrates the canvas. The smattering on field and railroad tracks, both hardy blooms and dainty flowers. The judge's house, the chicken farm, a migratory camp, a flesh motel, a stucco digs where all that mitigates the August swelter is the swamp pooler's immutable burr. A straggling house that draws its water from a hard water well and flushes out with the help of a crude sump pump. Before the flatland is occluded by the staunch of light at end of day, I wanted to be content with all its surfaces. Weed, barb, crack, rill, rise. But every candid shoot and fulgent branch depends upon the arteries beneath. The houses have their siphons and their circuit vents. The heart, I mean the literal heart, must rely upon its own plaque valves. The duodenal canal, its unremitting grumble, the brain upon its stem, and underneath a network vast of nerves that rationalize. The earth's a little harder than it was, but I expect that it will soften soon, voluptuous in some age hence because we captured it as art the moment it was most itself, fragile, flecked with nimble weed, and so alone it almost welcomed its own ravishment. I was a maiden in this versicolor plain. I watched it changed, withstood that change, the infidelities of light, the solar interval, the shift of time, the shift from farm to town. I had a man that pressed me down into the soil. I was that man, I was that town. They call the chicory ragged sailors here, sojourners who have finally returned and are content to see the summer to its end. Be unafraid of what the future brings. I will not use this particular blue again. Um, the next poem 
is, uh, you know, um, they always tell you that uh, if, if you don't know what the audience likes, always go with the dog poem. So um, this poem is called My Life as a Dog. Right, because everybody loves dogs. My life is a dog. If I was a dog, the only three things I'd chase, a fire truck, a ball, and my own tail. If I was a dog, you wouldn't be petting me. I might have rolled in something. As a dog, I'd roll over for cheese, not very good cheese. I'd bark all night until you let me out. You'd have to let me out. Don't worry, I wouldn't chase a cat or anything. I'm sure I'd think about it, but I just wouldn't. Someone would have to hold me when I got my shots. Would you hold me when I got my shots? I'd sneak into the garden and eat the pears off the trees. How would I do that? I'd be a dog, a crafty dog. If I was a dog, I'd have run away by now. I'd be a runaway. You'd think, bad dog. And when it was time to put me down, you'd be a little blue, then put me down. Um, one of the things that we liked to do when I was growing up, I don't know if it was the same for you, um, but uh, gas was a lot cheaper and there was no place to go. So we would just drive, you know, up and down the one main road of the town. That was what uh, everyone did. And eventually traffic would sort of peel off into the boonies. Um, this poem is entitled Ode to Joy. It is the joy of that car culture that uh, will hopefully disappear and become something else. So many automobiles. It must be Friday night. These are the golden eyes of Catatonia of the Valley. Of. They are the lights of of. Their procession is a thread of yellow ore across one bridge, across another confluence of rivers, the ones that seem to leave their beds and leave the shambled houses bare. Well, even to belong in this congested state, you have to spend a little bourbon on your nerves. They keep their low beams on. It's part of of, a subset of belong. Switching gears to Slaughterhouse Road or Garden Highway or up to the junction or out to the boat ramp at Cottonwood Star Bend. Everyone's a little wet in the V tonight. They're all getting sticky on the bucket seats. In their humid zones, there are humid smells. They stopped for eats. Will everyone be fed this good in heaven? Hey there, cowboy, here's your whopper. All roads lead first to Burger King, it seems. Or how's grub steak, home of the dude burger? This is one of those dreams that cause sleep eating in which as we float across a tiny bridge, our bodies, patty and bun, converge, and all we got to do is put the mustard on. The condiments of of can't stop your heart. Of the intimacy that flourished here, an outlaw just as outlaws themselves had flourished in the slapstick gold rush days, and men who came from China without wives, and boys who bundled together in the oaky jalopies, girls finding their way together through the pass, and others leaving Mexico or Vietnam behind could reinvent the space they occupied. Of teens, as teens must do, eating the potato nuggets of cupidity, scheming them on to that hunting road of dirt, whereupon the greatest intimacy of, of, and in, and through occurs. Of all the random shots one young man takes, of hit and run trade, the hidden features, 
of men with boogie woogie on their minds, their cups of ketchup and other dipping sauces creating little O's of transparency in their suck me off jeans. Of horrible missteps with fucked up chums, of low desire, of powerful urges, of release by one's own adulterous hand, of and of and of the feeling of somebody else should drive. Push Push in the Bush is the title of a dance hit, but it's just as easily a country song. Out there in the dark, they have found each other like lightning bugs, despite the pesticides, despite the blights that hit a town's periphery and stay. There is a luminescence of all things, of all things which are of a place, the place where they begin, therefore belong. Um, I'm gonna read a couple of new poems. Um, this poem uh, is uh, maybe the gayest poem I've ever written. Um, it's called The Book of Mermen. Um, and hopefully it's self-explanatory. We went to see The Book of Mormon, the musical. I was working on my own musical, The Book of Mermen. Mermen as in Ethel Mermen? No, I said, The Book of Mermen, those quizzical, mythical beasts, half fish, half man. Though I could see where, where Ethel Merman would make sense as a musical, an excruciating musical, covering the later years, the love boat years, the still pissed about Hello Dolly year and Valley of the Dolls, and the rumors over her sham marriage to Ernest Borgnine, a man whose mouth she turned from every time they kissed. But Ethel's got nothing to do with mermen. Ethel doesn't do flops and she doesn't drink water. And the only thing she's ever gone down on is a lamb chop. <laughs> mermen, I said, conversely, love to submerge in the moonlight and shimmer beyond the dark harbors where sharp reefs teem with sharks and rays and anemones. The mermen's tails get nipped and stung no one can live with a merman long. You could not stand the song, a blast more shrill than Ethel Merman on her disco album, the Ethel Merman disco album. Hi, I'd love to say C, but searching for a C is more accurate. In the middle of I'm always doing something, something for the boys. Merman migrate like the whales as they wail their merman song. The merman would only leave you stranded on the rocks. That must be how Rock Hudson felt when he had to belt with Ethel on a TV special, both of them sincere in their assertion that if baby, I'm the bottom, you're the top. No one wants to feel as uncertain as that man was when he tried to hit those notes. Afloat, best just swim away. Thank you for the musical. Thank you for the play. Thanks for the Book of Mormon and to Ethel Merman and to Merman. And thank God we're gay so we can hook up after the play with someone else. That last one reeked of fish. All right. Um, I, I've got uh, two more poems I'm going to um, read. Uh, one of them is. Uh, I've been watching a lot of Tarzan movies, particularly the Tarzan movies from the 1930s and early 40s that starred Johnny Weissmuller and Marino Sullivan. They did six films together. But to me, the biggest star of the movies never got their due. This is called Cheetah After. Uh, and if you haven't seen the Tarzan movies, Cheetah is uh, Tarzan's right-hand chimp. Cheetah after. He was a changed chimp after what Hollywood put him through. Retired to Palm Springs and opened a home for apes abused by show business, circuses, space programs, commercials, and the like. 
He took up painting, played golf, and never gave up smoking. They gave him a star in the desert on the walk of fame, such as it is in Palm Springs, in cement. Hollywood was fickle and the mammal du jour was flipper or a killer whale known as Free Willy. And all the damn dogs, Rin Tin Tin, Wonton Ton, Lassie, Benji, Cujo, Tiger, and that hee-haw hound named Blue. Cheetah was blue. Cheetah felt cheated. All that he knew was how to run away from lions, ride the backs of zebras, swing from the Silver Springs trapezes above the lagoon, and ride an elephant triumphantly, which frankly is a lot. He hurled himself into his art, some of which you'll find at cheetathechimp.org. Only Jane Goodall, of all the Janes in his life, remained his friend. And what of that man who once said, cheetah friend, and thumped his chest? He never writes cheetah back, not even a holler. Um, this last poem uh, was written um, during the first 4th of July of the pandemic. So that was um, uh, 2020. Um, and I don't know how it was uh, where you guys are, but um, here it seemed like 4th of July started about three months early and just kept going and going. And, um, you know, in California, we really worry about fires. And I was getting a little freaked out by all of the, yeah, I'm sure it was a reaction to being on lockdown. People wanted to just go out and shoot off some fireworks. But if you've been through a real fire, um, explosives are not as fun as they were when you were a child. This is called Elegy on Fire. I escaped from a building on fire with only my jeans pulled on and not even shoes on my feet as I stood there thinking of that Peggy Lee song, Is That All There Is? A stranger put a blanket on me. I wasn't on fire and didn't need to be put out, but it was clear I needed comfort of some sort and a human in the vicinity gave it. This is a 4th of July tale, the hazards of smoldering ordnance in the dumpster next to the kitchen window, the careless casual way we toss live ammo in the air, and golly gee, ain't that a shimmerer, ain't that a beaut, my father would say, who grew up in the land of fireworks and taught me before I could walk. The way to light a fuse is Hold it with your fingernails, so if it burns fast, it might burn you, but it won't explode. And always immerse the shells in water after, just in case. He who loved bombs went to Nam, collected guns. I always thought, like poets come out with collected poems, my father should come out with collected guns. But now he's buried in Saipan, though I think he'd appreciate the way my humor bombs sometimes. A weeping willow, he'd said, looking up at the sky while the bombs were bursting in air. What would he make of this display of affection years after we ran out of things to say? And what would he make of this country he served and questioned at the same time? The way we love and don't love our parents who are after all just grown kids a little smarter than us perhaps, but not by much, especially when they vote. I want to wake up the neighbors the way they once woke me, the buildings on fire, get out, get out. I want to have already rebuilt after patriotism has hurled its sparklers in the trash and scorched us all. On my way home on base, I'd hear retreat on the public address and stand at attention as it played out over the Kwanzaa huts and fences. 
over the bombers that sat on alert and the supersonic reconnaissance craft and the boys playing stickball, unexploded ordnance left over from a previous war, the trip wires cross the fields like spider silk, but finer. I put my hand on my heart. I put my heart over my head. I loved in the midst of war, the war's music. The Iliad lay on my bunk, open to the body of Hector on his shield. I was a boy, it was an island. It was far from home, but it was quarters and soldiers, beaches of white sand, and boy, the fireworks, they broke into a thousand threads cascading over the fields of Troy. But then I woke in a city on fire. And when I went to carry my father out, he was already on a pyre, he lit himself. It's a wonder the rest of us got out. Thank you very much, DA, for that magnificent reading. You, you see so much, you have a superlative use of language and there's a, a great simplicity and uh, in your writing, there's humor, there's a tenderness, and you have such depth, and it just, you make us all feel so relaxed when we're listening to you, and you take us right there uh, to what you're writing about, whether it's the 4th of July or, you know, the Book of Mormon, whatever it is that you're focused on. I have a, we have about five minutes left. I have a couple of questions I'd like to ask you. Sure. How, when did you write your first poem? Oh, uh, when did I write my first poem? I think, you know, um, in third grade, we had to um, write a poem about our favorite food. And I chose pizza because it was my favorite food. And, you know, um, not a great word to try to rhyme. Um, and yet, somehow I continued. Most of the early poetry that I wrote was sort of sort of a giant fuck you to art, you know, and like the pretentiousness of poetry. And somehow poetry always allowed a space for me to do that, which is, I think, a pretty cool thing about the art. Well, you may have answered the next question with what you just said, but what is it about the poetry form that attracts you to it as opposed to prose or playwriting or yeah. screenwriting? Well, that's a good question, Harry, because my my first inclination as an as a writer i wanted to be a playwright um but you know i spent a few years in theater classes and um i decided collaborative work was not my forte you know some of us really are just not only marching to the tune of a different drummer but we're coming in and out of different doors at different times and um with poetry, I could have control. I could manage to create an entire world in miniature. Um, I didn't have to have long-term investment the way that novelists have to or filmmakers have to. Um, I could, you know, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I would write 12 poems in a night. They weren't very good, but, you know, I feel like we're all gonna write a few hundred bad poems or more. Um, best to get them out of the way early. When you sit down to write a poem, do you write from an image? Uh, do words come from you? Is it emotion? Is it an idea? It's almost always some piece of language that has stuck in my head. Um, you know, uh, there's always this sub narrative going on. And um, I'll begin to sort of fixate over the relationship that two words are having with each other that somehow strikes me as unusual or different. And then things sort of begin to accrete. They build around that initial, um, it's almost like a disturbance, right? I think that uh, a pearl is a good uh, analogy, the way that, when an oyster feels some irritation in there, it sort of puts layers of knacker over and eventually the irritation stops. For me, poetry is that way of sort of reworking something that's bugging me until I've been able to sort of neutralize it or give it a rest. 
or you know, I write myself into exhaustion. On my last question, we have about a minute left. What would you tell a young poet who's sitting down to write her first poem to focus on? Uh, focus on on being yourself and making yourself happy. Um, you know, a lot of times I teach in a writing program and we talk about the reader um, as if this is like some mythical beast that uh, waits out there for our poems. And I'm like, you're the first reader and your friends and the people that you're writing the poems for. Make sure that you always come back to that place where you are satisfying yourself and not some, you know, imaginary critic that is uh, waiting to, to pass judgment on you. Well, thank you for such a wonderful reading. You have such deep relaxation and such a deep resonance and, you know, you just make us all feel relaxed and it just seems, I know you work hard at your craft, but it just seems so effortlessly, which is the key to all of the writing going back to Horace, you know, his advice. But uh, thank you very much for your great writing and we appreciate that very much, DA. Thank you so much, Harry. I'm looking forward to hearing Elena. Well, here she is. <laughs> A Pushcart Prize and Best American Poetry recipient, Elena Corinna Burns, the author of five collections of poetry, including If This Makes You Nervous, Omnidon Publishing 2021, her poems, reviews, essays, and interviews can be found in Poetry, the Kenyan Review, the Paris Review, and elsewhere. She is a 26-year programming consultant and Poetry Stage Manager for the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books. Here's a marvelous poet, Elena Corinna Byrne. Oh gosh, thank you so much, Harry, for asking me to do this. and. I'm so humbled and honored to read with Douglas. Um, just loved hearing you. Um, it's been a long time. And, uh, you know, even longer since COVID, <laughs> it seems like our measure of time has been completely changed. Um, so <clears throat> just, just a quick response to what you said about writing a few hundred bad poems. It, it just, I, I always like to bring this up, but my, my father, who was a famous um, art teacher, said you, you could tell how good an artist was by how many failures he had in his studio. And, um, and I believe that to be true. And I also believe it to be true, what you said about, you know, creating and letting poems build. And, and I think also, if you think about that in terms of the whole body of work, that we keep writing and rewriting toward the, some of the same subjects. And it's like, you know, trying to get rowing that boat toward shore. And it's, um, it's a necessary, difficult and marvelous process. Um, so I, I always change what I'm going to read when I, if I'm um, following someone, so I, I a little bit changed some of the what what I wanted to read because you mentioned dogs, <laughs> and I thought I only have one dog poem, which is actually in relation to this artist. Um, William Wegman is famous for his Weimarner dogs that he would dress up and and pose, and it, it sounds terrible, but he's you know he's he's very good to his dogs. There's no abuse involved. And, and he became quite famous for that later on. But this is what I remember is in my childhood. Um, I, my parents were artists. And as I said, my father was an art teacher and my brother had a poster of this on his wall, my brother, five and a half years older um, in his room. And so I had to have this because it also tied in with my preteen um, tomboy years where I desperately wanted to be a boy. So I'm going to read um, William Wegman's poem first. And um, I actually delightfully got to see his show recently. Um, okay, I picked the wrong page. Hold on a second. Um, so in uh, it's, you know, most of these poems that are from this book, and I'm not reading only from this book, but all the poems in this book that have an artist name in the title, they're usually referring to not one artwork, but to the sort of overall uh, body of work from the artist. 
And um, so that's just a little something that you should know. Um, okay, William Wegman's Weimar near William. Two shoes I took off at the party and left them in a foot field with others by the door. Looking back at them, ditched, looking at me, their Weimar near brown, obedient mouths. I wondered if they revealed personality and could be identified as belonging to me. W.W. photographed his shoes once, old pair, untied on, tied off, 1973. They together, I only remember because I thought I once recognized their sockless near twins in Van Gogh's painting, just askew, worn in, as if far windows wept away from them. As if once gray animals in our clothes groaned, then slept. Children love or hate their shoes, as they do dogs, teach themselves how to tie them up, keeping the left and right side by side, well behaved by the bed. Psychologists say that we choose pets and colors for a reason. We look alike. So be other, I say. Be a stand-in, souvenir, leggy for a moment while collapsing into the ocean room. So I guess from there, I'm going to go into some sort of family and family lost poems. But um, thinking about, uh, you know, again, what it's what it's like in our childhood. I mean, I use one word in this poem. Um, called it's conurbation, which is just emerging or emerging of cities, particularly. While why all portraits are a form of taxidermy, Ricardo Nikolaevsky. She should have been part his, a selfhood LA film still, limbs, memory, inoculum, and reckless too passing her own oneric face through the school halls to answer to no one endanger the time alone. City is conurbation, a merge. Look, she's one unworthy eye for seeing white pull out, for dancing the reverse into a square cut fields, blurred frame to frame. That could be anywhere, but I tell you, it's not just anyone. She has since been set free, to be the predicate sentence where fields come into view and come up as a friend's lost soundtrack. Elegy is alive there, not well, stripped of its wet clothes, pull floating face down, wrapped rubber tubing and a peeled light swatch, like a leaf stains negative image on the sidewalk ahead. How do you become your own portrait? A film's camera holds still for those who are moving. It was always hard for her to hold still as a child. She could not help herself. Teachers wanted to punish her, hovered into view, wood ruler held high above the head, measuring their own voices. I bet they saw a four-legged chicken, not child, doubling on anatomy. She refused to hear them felt only moving air's constant surrender. The she is obviously me. <laughs> but sometimes sometimes we have to step back a little bit. Um, okay, so this is... Um, Also, I think in reference, I loved all your references to those television shows and, and thinking about that period of time, of course, totally relate. Um, for those of you who are too young, you have to look it up. <laughs> all those characters and, and animals. Um, during this time, too, I decided to use this Laurie Anderson poem, which is related to her um, Cronus Quartet. She won an Academy Award for the piece, so please be sure to look that up. Which war is this, Laurie Anderson? And it's after Hurricane Sandy. Knit heavy clouds darning 
Haven't we earned the right to combat, earned heart of a dog knowing home? This live river splitting its blackened stitch gives up uncut gemstones while crossing streets, highway over Central Park's grass. The hurricane's daylight overhead, a hog's cloud now like one farmer's thousand year field plowed open as the mouth of another. Child shot in our new town, new country cigar galaxy that the naked eye can't see. Not meant to be smoke past making stars. And also the M82, those red thumb-sized bombs my brother and his friends placed in the storm drains beneath our houses. So many M80 spring sewers ago, waking dusk into believing it was dawn. Now water, freak water, raises the moon's dead river into bled glitter instead of road where justice and justice is match lit in the mouth as this city's drowning within its own arms. What time is it if you can't hear it coming? Carrying horizon's cow carcass, imagination's house, air size and unclear, and what stars thrown dice like pulled teeth from the year's head will it be? Which war making of ourselves to see only storm. So a little bit more on history. Uh, this is an older poem, um, which I'm not gonna find. Uh oh, um, never mind. I will skip then to. Um, We'll skip then to another poem from Squander um, about somewhat about sort of transitioning from um, the politics of family to politics. So this poem is called Rock and um, Charles Henry Turner was um, an African-American um, He's an African-American scientist, um, neurologist, zoologist, psychologist, and educate, educator. Um, he was the first person to discover that insects could hear and that their behavior can be altered based on previous experiences. It's a good metaphor, isn't it? <laughs> Rock. And this is um, from my older book, Squander. While yourself smitten split like a skull face, a killjoy guilty of hidden tattoo, blow for blow, sand multiplying miles, more a measure apart in apocalyptic paradise. No one said this brought the burnt bread, cured blood, cobbled, but it does untrouble the iron from the jaw, lime from stone belt, igneous, him writ in a great cleft near its cliff, a crag, true Mediterranean fever broken in the body gone blue. A Petra derived word origin, abyssal plain seen where Charles Henry Turner's ticking insects could hear, where you arrived heavy with soil, where a drunken carved coffin boat sank its salt bedding made. Finishing what it started, I assure you, no one else can revoke your first thought where you now stand. This is a newer poem. Sugar is a language I have access to. That's a quote from Marie Bar Margaret Braun, the artist who sculpts sugar into cups. And she also has an essay on sugar. Sugar is a language I have access to, she said, so I placed her at the missing fire table, the one still floating out to sea, the lights glittering false snow of it all, how sugar persuades loaf taste from sun's swarm of salt, the neighbor's ear, each agitated star frame where a woman's called sweet, meaning domesticated, swallowing pearls. 
Origin to the Chinese term sha che, sand sugar plant, signifying its sand-like result, handed down like anonymity from Arabic azucar, Spanish azucar, further mutated into sh, whose Greek passed into Latin, the mislaid porcelain white plate and cup she faces. That her indigestible body rhymes a nursery there, sinking with the overboard souls, telling her still not to harvest the cane. Don't take the cake home. I'm obsessed with word origins. I could write about those forever. Um, okay, so how are we doing on time? Um, just a few more. I'm reading different poems than I did a few days ago. I had a reading a few days ago. This is Bill Viola. If you don't already know him as an artist, he's astonishing. Um, and he makes these incredible films. And I read that what inspired so many of his art films was the fact that when he was seven, he almost drowned in a lake on a family vacation. And he remembers sinking down to the bottom of the lake and not being afraid and looking around around him while he was sinking, which is sort of an amazing story. Underwater with Bill Viola and underwater with you. It depends on where the coined air comes between you, me, your cry, and where tipped white water falls to fall from each limb, a crowned afternoon letting go of its memory, you. Your child body slipped quiet beside death, into a stilled lake beneath its mountain surrounding. Saw his new buried world rut beautiful there. All rain becomes sea, births a lake, becomes river, now water, as if this water was liquid window opening out, out into the light that already broke from the gape face of a blue orchid in another country moaned around the ankles of the one standing bedside beside you in the willing dark, as if to help your sleep breathing live a little longer. Invisible heavens will keep time climbing up inside your leg bones and waters baritone move swooning the room. A father will never be brother, brother never lover, Lover, not the mother, a ship you climb back into to find the brushstroke horizons past the sea's farthest tripwire end line, where the self annihilating, far, all deflowering sun then somehow escapes daily. Okay, I know these are a little abstract, so I'll, <laughs> I'll try it. My last two hopefully will be a little clearer. Um, thank you again. Um, this is about my cousin. And again, that same period of time, preteen years. And Ewo is Irizuku is um, an Ethiopian artist. Rescued high cactus. I'm certain it came from the sore same desert they body dragged my cousin Mark into so as to long torture him for testifying against the released drug dealer he fell from. Desert and flowers and ready rains flung spring curtain on the ground mixed with blood. No police, no police protection, and no pretty cut picture to a dry sky that also won't care about his childhood or abandoned cars, another fallen body foiled, rotting as food for animal. His flowers, hallucinatory color, sprouting its full wheel away from Duchamp detox clinics. Now the courtesy of the artist, this room, my room, reimagines his hour taken from all the hours. I know I heard him scream white, woke loud into a full silence and wondered what was real or where the tree fell and how many times it did fall before he was heard. Humans, a force of nature, no matter what anyone stops to tell you, force from nature. Greening is grief too. You 
times two. Okay, so the last poem is just, it's kind of an ours, but it's really just an, an ode to writing poetry. Poetry substance abuse is a Darwin's finch drawing <laughs> in motion or the air of abandon when you least expect it. Much like when they say your next love will come to you when you least expect it. Your face stopping there at the equatorial bulge because its pull at either seam is one continuous seam mount ring of fire already put out on your head, leaving you somewhere vocabulary continuum caught on pause. The pause button, the same as the mute button. Same as all faith in God is no God. Same as you are your last thought swallowed silver before it is said out loud to a tiny hand mirror sleeping in the involuntary dark inside your purse. Big enough for the birdcage thrown out in that alley trash heap. It's past songs now more a consequence of gravity than feathers defiance. Perfect is your perfect animal shape's imperfection in the making. Every dark matter's silent distribution shape and his origin tangle. Sweet physical chaos. Make whatever creates unequal harm. Thank you. Well, thank you for that wonderful uh, ode. It's revelatory, it's, it's revealing, it, you know, it's just lovely. And, you know, I love your poetry. You know, you have such a, a strength of narrative. It's erudite and your vision is original. And, you know, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about where you grew up and then also answer the same question I asked DA, you know, when did you write your first poem? Um, probably a little bit later, probably around the age of 12 is what I remember. I mean, I think I was probably exposed to poetry pre prior to that, but I remember a teacher asking us to write. And because I grew up with a family of artists, vision, you know, my mother was this abstract painter. My father ta taught um, drawing and Disney animators anatomy. And my brother was a conceptual artist. And I, I was exposed for some reason and not because my parents were bohemian by any stretch of the imagination, but I was exposed to a lot of contemporary and conceptual art when I was really little. And, and I remember thinking, you know, I didn't have the vocabulary to translate that experience or to describe it. But when this, this teacher, when I was 12, asked us to write a poem, um, or maybe it was 11. And um, I remember writing a poem and I don't remember the poem as well as, as Douglas remembers, but I remember it had color in it. And I remember thinking, where did that come from? And it was suddenly like having that that moment of recognition about something about yourself that is obviously mysterious and unknown and, and a little bit empowering that you didn't know was there before. Um, but I remember really not only wanting to distinguish myself from, from visual art, even though I loved visual art and I, I learned how to draw and paint and um, I just wanted something that was my own and I, and to distinguish myself seemed to be to find um, the, the visual through, through the language of poetry and to be able to sort of problem solve, you know, what was going on. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Los Angeles, actually. Um, even though we, we um, spent a year when I was a little older um, living in London and New York City, we came back to LA. So principally Los Angeles most of my life, yeah. You know, you talked about your family, the visual arts. What do you focus on when you begin a poem? Is it visual, something you see? Is it words? Is it an idea, emotion? Um, well, I'll say in the past, um, it almost always visual first. Um, but then I started doing, you know, after I had my first book published, um, my second book, Mask, was based principally on research because the research seemed to engender and trigger memories and thoughts and 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 and, um, 
like D.A. Powell was saying, you know, how how language marries more language and it keeps finding connection after connection after connection, you know, it's sort of like a dung beetle. I mean, you mentioned the pearl. <laughs> My, mine's a dung beetle <laughs> rolling his ball, you know, until it gets bigger and bigger. And that's, you know, I, I, uh, I rarely knew what it was that I was going to write about until I sort of en- entered the poem because, and I do believe in the, obviously in the trans in the um, revision process, our poems tell us a lot, but what, what, wants to happen and what is happening you know they begin to have a mind of their own but and I realized even today I read a lot of kind of abstract poems which probably won't be my future because um I'm writing screenplays now um and since I just finished my late life MFA in screenwriting but it was in writing in contemporary media and I fell in love with that narrative process and that I mean it is very, they're very similar you would say that they're both um you know they're both visual mediums um and but and they're both very aural you know close to the ear but clearly you know there has to be a clear narrative going on and there has to be also um you know an understanding of uh the the one thing though I would say is that for years I've done three panels at AWP on the relationship between poetry and film and I do believe there's a relationship when you think about how you're constantly having to move the poem forward and you're constantly having to move dialogue forward which is you know as you were saying like playwriting which I understood why you were attracted to that because um you know, uh, and that everything in a screenplay, everything has to belong the way it does in a poem. You cannot squander um, your your language, you know, it, that everything has to have sort of a reason and, and a will of its own um, is how I see it. So... <laughs> Now, being an actor, you you uh, hopefully you relate to that as well, an actor and a poet. Well, you know, years ago, Pauline Kael, one of my top five critics in film, said that film is poetry and and uh, television is prose. Mm. And, you know, you do have to, you know, working with Scorsese, one thing I noticed about him early on was compression. But uh, to get back to poetry, D.A. is a teacher for many years. Well, let's bring DA in. And DA, what would you like to say to uh, Elena and vice versa? What would Elena like to say to DA? Uh, we have a few minutes left. DA, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I, I, I'm so glad to hear you um, speak about the analogous form of the screenplay because um, really that has helped me so much in thinking about how poetry operates. Mm. Uh, uh, several years back, I started reading um, Sergei Eisenstein's screenplays, and I was like, "These are poems." You know, it's like he had—he's uh, writing silent film uh, screenplays, so right. it's really about this shot, this shot, this shot, and each time he combines them, it's like a little poem occurs. There's a <laughs> shot of the doctor examining the meat and seeing the maggots in it. Then there's a shot of the um, the chef's butcher knife chopping the meat. And then there's the shot of um, the ship's crew looking through the galley at what's transpiring. And then there's a shot of a pot boiling. And you realize that the pot boiling is the meat being cooked for their consumption Right. And it's also their anger coming to, and it's like, wow, film does beautifully what poetry um, also can do. It abs- well. Absolutely. And to I find love it. those places where things fit together. Yeah. Oh my God. And I love that example. We should do a panel together. <laughs> um, I love that example because I also love, I'm always telling my clients, my students, um, you know, to, 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 to rely and, and allow yourself to rely on the ordinary. And that out of that, you know, obviously comes the extraordinary, but, but those visual cues too, you know, how um, like in scary films, they'll suddenly focus on something really ordinary and, 
uh, it's seemingly inconsequential and they'll focus on it a little too long and you'll know something bad's about to happen, <laughs> right? Um, but I, I, um, I, I love the idea too that that they both to me poetry and film feel like they're constantly in motion. And you know Susan Sontag talked about Einstein and um and Godard, you know they they all talk about the relationship to poetry as did Tarkovsky. Um Tarkovsky wrote poetry and I think his father wrote poetry and he and he often equated the two. So so I think you know I'm I'm really excited and interested in in developing that um that ongoing conversation but but so I, I was so delighted that you made several references so it's it encouraged me to um you know because I didn't think I was going to write poetry ever again <laughs> which I know is silly to say I probably will but but you, uh, you gave me some encouragement in that way um okay. with what you read from what you read um, well and also I think it's important to remember that even though we make art publicly and send it out and mm -hmm. you know publish it that um we have to retain something that's for ourselves we mm -hmm. don't ever want to spoil that private relationship that we have with our art which is the relationship that kept us going when no one else was around to read our poems you know Right, right. And it is, and it's not solipsistic. It's, it's really a way of saying that that's where the original engine is coming from, right? And it's like where we, where we turn on the ignition is that, that place that, that the reasoning and the, the, the emotional reasoning behind emotional, psychological, whatever it is, you know, all those things that are behind that first moment of w wanting to write a poem. I love that. And DA. I could go on listening to you two for hours. Unfortunately, we have a number of shows set up. Uh, oh. Jennifer Clymer's a director and she goes from one show to another and it's two o'clock. And I just want to thank you both. Harry, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you everyone who joined us today. Lots of poets who I um, admire. Thank you, everybody. It, it was wonderful to see everyone join us and uh, your idea about having a panel to just discuss poetry and film and screenplay, I think that's a wonderful idea. And maybe maybe that's fodder for a future Harry's Poetry Hour. Sounds good to me. Oh, I love that idea. Thank All you. Right. Thank you guys so much. It was, it was wonderful. Thank Harry, you. what's happening next week? Next week, we have uh, three residents, actors, and one uh, actor from outside there, Corinne Conley, Kay Wiseman, Tony Sawyer, Beth Ruscio, Ruscio, and they're going to read my favorite poems. Yay. That's going to be amazing. Uh, thank you both so much for being with us today. I look forward to seeing you again. Mm -hmm.